Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Digital Fundraising Tools and Trends for 2018 with Michael Stein. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. So all callers will be muted. So if you have questions, you should be seeing a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. If you lose your Internet connection, just reconnect to the link that was emailed to you and, or refresh your browser. Um, and you should be able to uh, see and hear the webinar from there. If you have to leave early or you want to watch the webinar again, we will be hosting the webinar on our website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. You'll also receive an email once the presentation is over with the recordings and a link to the slides that were presented today. And also if you're on social media, feel free to send us a tweet at TechSoup and you can use hashtag uh, TSWebinars. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. We are located <clears throat> in 236 countries and territories, and we work with over a million uh, organizations around the globe. So um, just to give you guys a chance to try using your chat box, uh, it would be great to hear where you guys are calling in from. So if you just want to type in your location uh, in the chat box, and I can read out a few of those. All right, we have St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, uh, Waco, Helena, Seattle, Rhode Island. Do we have any uh, international folks on the call? Uh, from Guatemala. Guatemala, great. We have Guatemala. Um, cool. So it looks like we have people calling in from from all over the place, which is great. Um, so TechSoup partners with several technology companies such as Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft. Symantec um, so that we can provide both software and hardware uh, to nonprofits either at donation or for a discounted price. So if you have questions about how TechSoup can help your nonprofit, please visit www.techsoup.org for more information. And now I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today, Michael Stein. So Michael Stein has been a writer and digital strategist for over two decades. He is the author of three books and numerous articles about digital marketing, mobile engagement, and online fundraising. He works as a consultant and a coach to nonprofits, foundations, and educators with a focus on marketing and fundraising. And myself, I'm the online learning producer here at TechSoup, so I will be um, helping Michael with uh, the Q&A uh, throughout the presentation. And then we also have Lashika, who you guys have, might have had a chat with already. She is going to be assisting us with chat on the back end. So if you have any technical questions, please let us know. If you have any difficulties, um, she's here to help you. So I am going to go ahead and pass it off to Michael. Yeah, thank you, uh, Seema, for getting us started uh, for today's webinar on Digital Fundraising Tools and Trends for 2018. Um, uh, this is Michael Stein, uh, and I'm coming to you today from Northern California. Very, very pleased to be here with you. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working for many fine nonprofit organizations around the country and around the world of different sizes um, and different missions, uh, and have definitely you know, in, enjoyed many exciting digital fundraising campaigns uh, over, the, over the years. Um, so um, what is digital fundraising? Why don't we just dive in? I thought I would start us off with a little definition. Um, and it's, about using all the digital channels that are at your disposal in an integrated way to reach your audiences and, of course, their friends and family with the goal of sparking engagement and growing your giving opportunities. Um, I mean, it's a fundraising practice that I've watched evolve for 30 years, and it's definitely a field that is constantly evolving. So I'm glad to um, be able to talk about digital fundraising techniques today that that work and also discuss some of the latest trends that are emerging in 2018. Um, I think my goal, I will say my goal today um, is to inspire you to, to keep improving your own digital fundraising practices so that you can engage more with your supporters and of course to raise more money to fund your causes. I also want to mention that just throughout the presentation I have um, screenshots. Um, that are over on the slides. Uh, whenever I put a screenshot, they're usually from a, a project that I've worked on directly or indirectly. Um, and I always try to put uh, the name of the organization, the date, 
on which the campaign took place, and uh, a web address, a URL, in case you want to learn more about the organization. So hopefully that gives uh, you a little bit of context. Um, let's see. Uh, what digital channels are people using for fundraising? I started out by thinking of it that way. Uh, and immediately after this slide, we are going to ask you a quick survey so that you can answer this for yourselves. But these are the digital channels that I'm seeing um, that are being used now. I mean, obviously, email lists probably at the top of the list, both for messaging and fundraising appeals. Um, people using their website uh, and the amount of visitors that come to the website for fundraising. Uh, people are continuing to try to use social platforms, probably the biggest ones being Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, video continues to be popular, and platforms including YouTube especially uh, make a lot of fundraising tools available to nonprofits. Facebook Live has been uh, a, big, um, a big item this year. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I still continue to see people to try text messaging. Um, recently get messages from uh, Catholic Relief Services and a few other groups. Um, I get a lot of continue to get requests for personal fundraising campaigns, and we also see folks um, using digital advertising and using that to try to reach out to, to their followers and to other folks. Um, so that's a quick, just a quick way of, that, that I'm sort of thinking of the different digital channels uh, that are being used for fundraising. And if I go here, it is in the right way. So um, here's our. Here's one of our surveys. So if you wouldn't mind answering this question for those of you who can see this clearly, the question is, what areas of digital fundraising do you know the least about? So we're curious to know uh, what different areas of interest people have. So take a close look. And this should mirror pretty closely um, the content on the previous slide. Um, but I'm going to continue Whoop, watching those responses go right up. <laughs> Nothing like living in real time here. I'm just going to pause and uh, reflect on these numbers for just one second. Some of them are now in the triple digits. Converting website visitors, digital ads is in second place. I need help with all the above. Okay, fair enough. Okay, terrific. That actually is incredibly helpful. Okay, I am going to keep moving along. So um, here's how I want to organize the next 15 minutes. We're going to go fairly quickly just so that we can cover as much ground as possible. Uh, and hopefully if you have further interest, you can um, take a look at the, uh, um, the PowerPoint, which, which will be delivered to you later if you want to get some of the details or look at some of the screenshots. But really quickly, I think the way that I'm going to organize our time today is in these sort of eight different uh, topic areas. I'm going to start off by talking about how to make your website as sort of donor and fundraising ready as possible. I want to talk about donation pages, which are absolutely critical for fundraising. I'll talk a little bit about different donor platform options that are out there. Uh, I'm talking about choosing one. Um, we'll spend a good chunk of time talking about email fundraising, which is a core part of um, fundraising online. Uh, we'll talk about promoting monthly giving, which is a growing field. We'll check in on personal fundraising campaigns. Of course, we'll talk about social media fundraising, and we'll end with digital advertising to reach donors. And I'm sort of noting that both the website and digital advertising are the two top uh, items that came up on the survey. So we'll be sure to cover those items. Okay, let's, let's dive right in. So the first area is about making your website donor ready. I know I've seen so many nonprofits you know, just really take their websites to new places. And the fact that websites are easier to build, cheaper to build, I think has, you know, the last few years have just been tremendous. I mean, for fundraising, obviously the most important pieces are, and where's my little pointer when I need it, are of course, you know, making sure that the donate button um, is as prominent as possible uh, in the navigation. Um, and also that when you are doing a fundraising campaign, um, oh, I'm being that's a good idea. I will go green. How's that? <laughs> uh, when you're doing also a fundraising campaign that might be happening in email or might be happening in social, it's just super important to sort of take advantage of some of these top areas on the home page so that you get the most possible visibility from people that are visiting your site. So if you have a carousel or if you have a top news section, these are just critical places. And I know that they will displace other content, but it's just so important um, to get it there front and center. 
Um, another theme is that, you know, the website has to do is has to anticipate you know, the, chat, you, know, you know, the traffic that's just going to come from other channels. You may be doing a mailing in the mail. And as you know, a lot of people who get direct mail often don't want to put checks in the envelopes. They go straight to the web and make the gift. So it's very important that your website anticipate that traffic of, of, fund, of people who want to make donations who are coming sort of from these other channels of promotion. And then finally, just you know, critical to consider the screen sizes. Um, you know, people are on their mobile devices constantly. Uh, and so you know, any website that's going to be fundraising ready or donor ready I think has to, um, you know, has to be completely mobile responsive. So I think that's really a, a, a top consideration. Um, if I can get a – there we go. Um, the, other, I mean, uh, the other theme that I just want to talk about really quickly, I mean, I think that the biggest trend really in, in websites for fundraising that I think has just been clear in the last few years is the importance of using pop-up light boxes during fundraising campaigns. I mean, you know, we see these a lot at the year end, like in December, November, when you know, most fundraising happens. But it's totally fine to use these at any time of the year when you're doing a fundraising campaign. If you're doing a fundraising campaign in the mail, if you're doing promotion on social media, and if you're doing email, you, you know, it, the biggest trend is having the pop-up light box you know, made available on your website. It shows up on your home page, and it should also show up on the, on the top 10 or 20 pages of your site. Um, and again, you, know, you only have to show it to, to new visitors sort of once. You don't have to keep showing it over and over again. You can use a little cookie to disable it so that it only gets shown once. But these are really um, critical. These are a couple of examples. This on the left is from the SETI Institute. This one over on the right is from Corporate Accountability. The one on the right is actually promoting a monthly giving campaign they were doing. The one on the left is a very clever graphic for a, a, a space organization uh, promoting their, their year-end giving campaign. Um, hey, hey Michael. Another, sorry. Yes, hey, Michael. Know. Sorry, can you just um, – we got a couple of questions about what a pop-up light box actually is. So if you just yes, don't mind. Enough. Okay, so um, no problem. Quick. A pop-up light box um, is basically a, uh, you know, a, a graphic that pops up literally on top of the home page. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these when you're you know, just searching around the web. They're promoting all kinds of stuff. And for a nonprofit during a campaign, you, you know, the, these images right here would literally appear – you know, on the top of your home page, for example, or one of your, or really any of the pages of your website. Um, so it's a little piece of, it's a, it's a graphic image um, that you do have to work with um, your webmaster or webmistress to get it programmed and installed on your site. And you say, you know, I want it to run from this date to that date. Uh, and the, 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 it's also sometimes called a light box. And when a, a, a visitor clicks on the light box, it then takes the, person directly to your donation page. So it's really this quick path from, from the light box uh, into your donation page. And because it's so boof, interruptive and right in front of people, um, it's really one of the most effective techniques for fundraising on websites. Great. Here's I just showing you another example. Uh, this is a light box from the Middle East Children's Alliance. They use it at the year end. Um, you know, really you know, some, you, you don't have to use photographs if you don't want them, but I, I liked this one especially because I thought the photograph sort of captured the essence of the work they were doing with kids. Um, you can see there's the Donate Now button right here. It's requesting a tax-deductible gift. Uh, and so, you know, this is a, 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 good, a good example um, of, of, a light, of a light box and how it can be used in fundraising. Um, I do want to pause for just a second to talk a little bit about mobile usage trends. Um, I mean, the one thing to just keep in mind is that you know, t la in 2017, according to the, some of the studies, 21% of all online donations were made like on a mobile device. Someone's using their mobile phone in their hand and typing in their credit card number on the screen. And so um, you know, this number has been creeping up more and more and more. Now that it's sort of over that 20% tipping point, I think it, it, it speaks about the importance uh, of having uh, really a, a, a mobile responsive website. I mean, all of your donation pages need to be mobile responsive. We'll talk about that in a second. All of your email messages need to be mobile responsive because you should expect that you know, a quarter or more of all of your activity is going to be occurring with your donors using smaller mobile devices. So it's no longer just big screen 
and so on and so forth. So that, that, that's just, just really important to, um, to keep in mind so that you can always put your best foot forward and so that you know, you're, 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 you're in, in front of people uh, where they are. They want to make a gift while they're sitting at their dinner table. That's great. Or in front of the couch, that's great. Um, if they want to continue to give on a laptop or on a bigger screen, you know, that's, that's fine as well. You, should, you, know, you, you can track your mobile traffic very easily on your website. Most websites you know, offer um, that kind of a tool if you're using Google Analytics or something like that. Um, so really what, you, what you're looking for you know, is the, 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 the percentage of mobile traffic versus non-mobile traffic. And I often say once you've reached that 20% tipping point, you know, everything you do should be, should be fully mobile. Okay, let's get back on track. Um, let's talk for a few minutes about improving your donation pages. So a donation page in digital fundraising is obviously the page that's sitting kind of attached to your website, which allows a donor to be able to make a donation uh, in, in real time using a credit card, using a debit card, using a PayPal account, I mean, whatever the, the, the tool that they, you know, the finance tool they might be using. Uh, but these donation pages you know, are ubiquitous um, and just a really important piece of your puzzle. Um, the one thing to note is that the, uh, the average you know, of, of the number of people who kind of complete that page once they get there is actually only 17%, which always is a staggering number when I realize it, that it seems so low. In other words, for every 100 people that reach your donation page, only 17 of them just sort of go through to make the gift. The other, you know, uh, you know eight, eight, 83 of them are kind of still scratching their head and they're not quite sure. Um, so I think that's an important average thing to keep in mind. Um, and I really, it really speaks to the importance of you know, really working hard to improve your donation page with clear headlines, um, you know, a clear what we call a value proposition, making the case for giving, and last but not least, the images. And so all of those three things really have to, have to come together on these donation pages um, to make an impact. And probably the reason why so many people abandon a donation page is because they're not, they're not feeling it when they get there. The image is maybe there's no image, or the image is kind of boring, or it's, you know, it doesn't really speak to them. Maybe the headline is just not captivating enough. So really, those are really the, the key things. The other key thing, of course, is that the donation page in a perfect world should match the messaging that you've been using as part of your campaign. If you're you know, raising money to you know, plant trees in X neighborhood, by the time they reach the donation page in a perfect world, you know, the same theme is reflected there. Uh, so that you know, the messaging really should, should match when, when, when you do a campaign. Uh, and then finally, you know, good, good photos you know, really move the needle a lot. In fact, they're probably the most important item in terms of you know, testing and statistics and so on and so forth. Like a photo can, can improve the donation page conversion rate more than probably any other factor. So that's something um, for, you to, for you to keep in mind. Here's a couple of other examples. This one, again, is from the Middle East Children's Alliance. I apologize, a little bit hard to see, but I thought that the headline um, was very strong, Help Protect the Health, Lives, and Rights of Children in the Middle East. I thought the photo was captivating. I mean, this one, I mean, there's actually quite a lot of text here, maybe a little bit too much. But again, they, they, they worked hard to kind of connect the dots here uh, and, and, to make, and to make this strong. Um, here's another one from Defenders of Wildlife. Um, what I liked about this particular one was that they were actually promoting their match, which they had been you know, doing at the year end, and so, which I think is, you know, again, connect, connecting the dots between the messaging you're sending out an email, maybe you're promoting it also on social media. By the time the prospective donor reaches the donation page, he or she you know, is seeing um, this, you know, the, the match reflected here. So as they decide, hmm, should I make a gift of $30 or $50? You know they're able to, to to reflect there. So you can see how you know when what ends up on the donation page plays a role in helping that in helping that donor um, to make to make to make their choice and to make a gift. Um, okay, thinking about trends, what's hot this year? What's important? I mean, the biggest trend that I'm seeing is that people are building simpler donation pages. So reducing clutter, removing fields that you don't need. Um, you don't need to address fields. You don't need to know if someone's Mr. or Mrs. or Dr. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can take out that really aren't necessary. And also removing 
headers and footers, things that just add clutter. And so we've noticed that when we do testing, that the more you, the simpler you make donation pages, the more people donate through those pages. So they, they improve the conversion rate. Um, another big trend that we're seeing this year is that people are making monthly giving as the default giving type. Normally it's like, you know, make a one-time gift of $50 or $75. Now what we're seeing this year is make a monthly gift of 5 or $10. And so that's becoming the default as people are thinking, hmm, maybe those lower gift levels. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Maybe those lower gift levels are, are helpful. Um, there's a move away from credit cards, probably because of all the credit card fraud and debit card fraud that exists out there. There's a big move towards you know, getting PayPal added to their pages. So people are selecting vendors that have PayPal, or they're adding links to PayPal. So this is something for you to think about. Um, lots of embedded videos on donation pages. So that's an important, um, it, you know, if you're doing a lot of work with video as part of your fundraising campaigns, we're seeing a lot of folks embedding them on their donation pages right at the top. Um, and then, uh, you know, they have to sort of synchronize the video a little bit with the messaging. But as long as they've done that, um, we're seeing a lot more of that. I talked a lot already about the importance of making these donation pages multi, excuse me, mobile responsive. Another theme is just moving towards donation pages that aren't this big, long, one page, but what are these so-called multi-step pages. This example from Mercy for Animals on the right here is a multi-step page. And you start out by choosing a donation amount, um, whether it's a monthly gift or a one-time gift, and then click, and you go on to the next, to the next page. So that there's a lot of testing that's being done that this tends to not it's be less overwhelming. Sometimes people get to these big, long pages with like, you know, the 40 fields, and they're like, oh, I don't have time for this. And so these multi-step pages um, seem to be a super big trend here. Um, and two final things, uh, you know, because so many people abandon their donation pages, there's a lot of people who are working um, with what are called abandoned shopping cart recovery tools, so that, you know, if someone abandons the gift, a little bit like if you abandon something on, you know, a, a retail store, um, it will then follow up with you with an email, assuming they have able to gather your email, or it might push marketing at you uh, through advertising, which I'm sure you've had the experience of doing. If you go to a store, you don't buy something, you leave it in the cart, and lo and behold, that, those bags, that bag, that cart, you know, the, that item you were trying to, trying to buy you know, shows up and follows you around the web with retargeting. So those kinds of tools are available to nonprofits, and they're actually quite popular and a good way to recover those donors who didn't finish making their gift. And another big trend is just you know, more and more gift tracking by channel. In other words, if someone makes a gift, you know, where did they come from right before? Did they come from social? Did they come from your website? Did they come from Facebook? You know, so more detail, granular detail on, on, on where they're coming from. All right. Um, which is a good, uh, let me quickly just talk a little bit about analytics because I mentioned it before. I mean, I think that, you know, people are always sort of like, what should, what should I measure, Michael? What, what should we track? And I think this slide gives you maybe the, the top things. I mean, I think you want to know sort of what's working, you know, year over year, you know, what's improving, what's declining. I mean, you obviously you want to, you're obviously measuring revenue, but not just that. You're also revenue, you know, is the average gift going up or going down? Um, how are you doing with monthly donor recruitment? So those are really good um, elements to track. Um, also by audience segment, you know, your smaller donors, your mid-sized donors, your larger donors, your recurring donors, there's all kinds of audience segments that you probably break out your, fund, your donor audience in. So it's important to measure that performance. You know, how much traffic is getting to your donation pages and how are those pages converting uh, and also tracking revenue from social media. I think all of these are super important digital fundraising metrics or analytics that you should be looking at year over year and helping you, you know, make decisions about how you're doing and where there might be areas for improvement. Okay, let's dive into area number three, which is donor platforms. Um, there are a lot of donor platforms. That's one way that I'll just put it, more choices than ever. Um, I mean, there's continues to be, you know, constant growth in what I will just call simple or, uh, you know, Simple, simple tools like email tools or donation tools. I mentioned just a few vendors here by name, um, but I'll, I'll talk more about others later. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a lot of nonprofits, especially the smaller organizations, are using these simple tools. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, little by little, folks are interested in migrating into 
into tools that are a little bit more integrated. And over here on the left, I just have a, ver a really quick sort of rundown of kind of, the, kind of the six kind of key areas, six, seven key areas that people are looking for for functionality from their donor platform. I mean, this is the irony. We're calling it a donor platform. Um, but in fact, these donor platforms have grown into other kinds of platforms, able to help people with advocacy or activism, uh, be able to schedule events, um, be able to do you know, other types of integrations um, with, with, with other tools that, that they might be using, and of course doing email more generally for the organization. So um, you know, what started out as like simple donation buttons has definitely got a lot more complicated. Um, uh, but also a lot, of, a lot more choices. So what I often tell people is, you know, take some time to understand what your, what your needs are in the organization. Um, you know, think about your, you know, how, how mobile you, you need to be, and I often say you do need to be fully mobile. Um, think about you know, what your growth is going to be like over the next couple of years. You know, what do you, how do you need a platform to help you grow? What's your budget? In fact, a lot of organizations don't have a budget for these types of technologies, so it's a good, a good question to ask. Um, Reading reviews, you know, getting demos and referrals um, are definitely super important um, to help you, you know, think through um, the platform that you might want to use. Let me, let me mention two tools that are just uh, invaluable for nonprofits that I recommend uh, very strongly. Uh, one of them is this wonderful Consumer's Guide to Low-Cost donor, low donor Management System, um, which uh, has been republished, I think, about three times. Um, it profiles about 32 different platforms, definitely targeted at small to medium-sized nonprofits. Um, and it's really an absolutely terrific guide, um, and it has sort of compares the different systems around different functions. It also has pricing comparisons. It's really an absolutely invaluable tool, and I would say, you know, Start here if you're a small to medium-sized nonprofit and you want to think about, you know, are you on the right platform or you're looking for a new one or you're starting out and you need a brand new one, really um, pretty invaluable. And I have, we have a link um, to this a little bit later uh, in, in the guide here. Um, another guidebook which is helpful, another tool, is this one called the Nonprofit Guide to Online Engagement, which is published by Firefly. They, uh, they only look at a smaller group of seven platforms, and definitely this one is targeted more kind of at medium to large nonprofits, uh, but also you know, really invaluable. I know that there's a lot of organizations here uh, on, on the call, on the webinar. Uh, some of you may fall into this medium to large um, size. Um, but anyway, I think both of those tools would be invaluable, and I definitely, um, definitely recommend you, you get a hold of them both. In terms of trends, um, I mean, probably the biggest trend is that you know, there's more options than ever before. I mean, I've been doing this work for over 20 years. I've sort of given up trying to keep track of them all. It's just physically impossible. Uh, and I feel like every month there's a new one that's making its appearance, which is great. The more the merrier, but obviously there's a lot of options that are designed to fit all different size organizations, different budgets, different types of functionality. I would say generally that there's a good trend in terms of the prices for these things have gone down, um, which I think is a good thing. You can start out on one platform at a certain price point before you have to spend more for more, uh, more functionality. Uh, the mobile tools have just improved dramatically in five years, which is uh, a big thrill um, and really an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, the tools have become more integrated, which I think is really important. If you're building an email list, you should be able to really easily you know, push those, you know, fundraise off the list really quickly, or if you have some kind of peer-to-peer -peer or other kind of platform, you know, the integration really becomes critical um, so that it can more seamlessly, uh, the modules can talk to each other, and so that you can basically do, do more fundraising. Um, credit card management, this used to be you know, a little bit of the unspoken nightmare of these platforms. You know, people's cards run out or they expire or you know, they need to be re rerun. Um, this has gotten a lot better, and I think this has helped nonprofits a lot with fundraising. So this, this, this is great. Um, and another trend, uh, more and more social media integration. So as you, know, you bring on a constituent on your file, some of these platforms will automatically tell you which one of these folks are on social media, which platforms they're on, who is an influencer, uh, which might allow you to target those individuals uh, in, in, a, in a more focused way. So all of those are trends that I think are um, really um, helpful in donor platforms. Okay, I'm going to pause there, uh, Seema, and uh, see yeah. if you have any 
questions that you think um, you want me to answer before I go on to email fundraising campaigns? All right, let's see. So there's a few that came in. Um, I think this one was from a little bit earlier. So Anne was asking, are you saying that multi-step pages is good or bad? I think that was from a little bit earlier in your presentation. Fair enough, yes. Um, as a general rule, I would say multi-step pages are good in the sense that you know, when they're tested up against you know, single pages, the multi-step pages almost always perform better. I mean, one of the main reasons is that they, look, they work better on mobile devices. Uh, they're more seamless and so on. So if someone says to me, you know, if I have a choice, I would always say multi-step. Um, but again, not every donor vendor platform has multi-step pages. So it's really a little bit of a choice you end up make, making when you select or use a specific donor platform. Okay, perfect. Um, and I think I'll ask you one more question, and then we can save the rest for the end. Um, somebody was asking, are, are these website add-ons expensive? Um, I'm trying to think of what, how, what the word add-on might be referring to. I mean, if you're referring to donation pages, I mean, the pr uh, no, I mean, in the sense that like the, the price points can be are, have gone down a lot. I mean, by that by that I mean, you know, there's you know, you you can get a donation page for as little as twenty dollars a month, plus credit card processing fees. So the price points have gone down tremendously. Um, if, if if you're talking about donation pages. Um, if your question related to pop-up light boxes, which it might have, I mean, those would require you to work with a webmaster or webmistress to help you install them. They don't really cost anything other than the time that it would take to install a pop-up light, light box on your website. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and then actually, let me just ask you one more question. Um, for multi-step donor pages, how many steps or click-throughs um, are ideal? I mean, I would say probably around three. I mean, typically on the first step, you collect the amount of the gift of the person, and whether it's a one-time or a monthly gift. So you start out just with the gift amount, because that's kind of the biggest thing that you want to get from them. You know, that's the hardest choice, right? Then on the second page, you know, you're typically gathering some demographic information. What's your name? What do you, you know, address? And then on the third page, you're typically gathering payment information, and then there's a button to finish the process. So that's a traditional, I would say, three steps. I say that, and I see, four, I see sometimes four steps, and sometimes I see two. But you know, two or three, maybe three would be fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think we're good for now, and then I can save the rest for the uh, Q&A at the end. Great. Um, let's keep going. Um, so email fundraising campaigns, definitely a big piece of the digital fundraising um, uh, for, for, for using all, the, all these tools. So uh, I went looking for statistics. I mean, um, email accounts for about 26% of all online revenue according to some of the studies, and, uh, which means you know, there are other channels that raise more. I think what's interesting about email is that it's a very quantifiable uh, kind of channel that you can use. You've got, you have a bunch of emails. You have your email addresses. You can send them when you want. You can send again when you want. You can look at open rates and click through rates. So it's a very sort of quantifiable um, tool, and I think that's why email fundraising has just become really the, you know, kind of the, the best performing channel that we have when we do digital fundraising. Um, open rates for email fundraising tend to hover around 13%. Uh, and then uh, here's probably the shocker, which is always, always a reminder of how challenging this medium can be. The, email, the average email fundraising response rate is 0.05%. So to put that into normal math, it takes about 2,000 emails that you have to send out to your file, I mean to 2,000 people to generate a single donation. So you have to have a file size of at least 2,000 to start doing fundraising. Um, I mean, this is how it works in terms of, of averages. Um, not everyone's response rate is 0.05. This is really kind of a national average across thousands of nonprofits. I meet, uh, I have a client right now that has a 0.25% uh, response rate. Another one that has a 2% response rate. So these things can, can vary, but it gives you kind of a benchmark point to give you a sense if you're starting out 
I mean, this is really the average that we're working with, and it gives you um, a sense of scale. Also, the average one-time gift um, from an email appeal in 2017 was $87. Um, which can help you to think a little bit about, well, where, where do you fall on that? Are you around that amount, a little bit lower, a little bit higher? Um, all of these particular numbers, by the way, come from the MNR 2017 Benchmark Study, which I mentioned on the last slide. And they, by the way, are publishing their 2018 edition next month. So hopefully uh, you will get a hold of that uh, and use that to, to help you grow, grow and learn, which it does for me every time I read through it. Um, so the key to email fundraising, you, many of you probably know this already. You have to, you know, creating a series of messages so that you can capture your campaign theme. Uh, the series of messages, you know, could span could span a month, it could span three weeks, it could span more than that. But it's typically a messaging arc that allows you to communicate and get into people's inboxes. Um, these things work best when you have some kind of a visual design template that you can use to capture your campaign. And of course, part of what you're doing in, in most fun, digital fundraising, as in the non-digital fundraising, is you're increasing the urgency as you're getting closer to the, the deadline or to the end. So whether you're doing this at year end, you're doing it in the spring, you're doing it in the fall, you really want to use all of these tools. A quick example here on the right is from uh, a Plow, Plowshares Fund. This was before they, uh, they did a rebrand. But I always love the way they, they try to capture their, their brand colors and use uh, a nice theme um, to kind of build urgency, the midnight deadline, the $20,000 year-end challenge, you know, you know, and of course putting in um, individuals, in this case a couple of celebrities, to help, to help build the buzz. I think on this next slide I have another example of, uh, of a campaign. This one is from the SETI Institute, um, which is in Silicon Valley in California. I thought uh, I was able to scrape this out of their year-end appeal. Uh, and what you can see here is just a, a, just a great example of how to build a campaign in email with an email template. You start out with a low goal. The goal goes up. You can see the red. They have a little thermometer bar. They've got different speakers, different writers that are communicating the message of their campaign. They've got nice big match my gift buttons because this happens to be a match. And one of the messages, they're offering a book as a premium if you gave over a certain amount. And at the very end, as it got closer and closer to December 31, they were even able to put a graphic that had a, uh, a countdown clock. I don't believe it was a moving clock, um, but it was definitely um, something that created a lot of urgency. So I just, just loved how they, uh, they, they put this piece together. A um, couple trends in email fundraising. Uh, probably the top one uh, is, that, again, mobile responsive templates. And I have this example here of how, again, Plowshares Fund went from a non-mobile responsive to a mobile responsive. Mobile responsive is all one column, um, larger headlines, um, a, a normal font, so more of a normal font size, um, and then getting rid of these little sidebars. So again, really uh, moving towards mobile responsive um, templates. Another uh, trend is what I would call graphic-rich email. So you know, get rid of the long paragraphs of text. Uh, you know, go for a photo, go for a thermometer, go for images, graphics. Make the text really short. There's a big trend that we've seen this year, and these usually work terrifically well uh, on mobile devices because they're just fun, or, fun to read and to look at. Um, a third big trend uh, is countdown clocks. I mentioned this a moment before with Plowshares. Some of these countdown clocks, if you can embed them inside the email, will actually count down. Uh, this one's from the Democratic National Committee, the one that writes from Corporate Accountability International. I mean, talk about you know, b building tension uh, at the end of a campaign when you want people to make a gift before a certain deadline, which could be the end of the year, but it could be any other time of the year as well. Um, and of course, the other big trend, which is a trend uh, that continues to grow year to year, is email list growth. I created just a separate slide just to capture a few of these ideas, and folks can take a look at this on their own. I mean, this is definitely a big year uh, for people to grow their email list. Um, you know, doing it on their website uh, with signups. You can, in fact, use pop-up light boxes, which we talked about before for fundraising. Those are also really popular for asking people to leave their email addresses. I mean, people are working on social media platforms with uh, downloads or quizzes um, to get people to offer their email addresses. For those of you that work on uh, political or advocacy campaigns, uh, the use of petitions and advocacy campaigns, just such an important way to gather email addresses, which can later be used for fundraising. 
Um, there are numerous vendors out there that can provide help um, to help you uh, get lists to what are called paid growth. Um, there's a couple of vendors like Care2 or Change.org, and there's a few others that I can, that I can mention that are specialized in that. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have a direct mail program, um, there are vendors that will help you acquire emails through public databases for, for people on your direct mail file. Okay. All right. Let me keep moving forward and talk quickly about monthly giving, or sometimes it's called sustainer giving. So this is the fastest growing giving segment right now. Um, I mean, it saw like literally 23% growth in 2017. Um, and an account, when you look at it sort of on average, I think in the last numbers I had for 2016, it's about 16% of all on-rend revenue is coming from monthly giving. And this is a huge change over the years when it really wasn't a very important way of giving. I think economic pressures and other factors have made it that people, people want to give less, but they don't mind giving more often, which, is a, which I think is a, is a great trend. People tend to stay on your file longer. Um, in the end, uh, you know, if you raise more money from them, you just do it over a, a longer period of time. The average uh, giving level of a monthly gift uh, is $23. Um, but I see plenty of people um, asking for monthly giving levels of much lower numbers than that. I've seen them three, four, five dollars um, I think uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign was trying it at like $2. Uh, why not get people in the door and you can always um, um, upgrade them later? Um, monthly donors tend to be people who are recent donors, people who have given to your organization frequently, uh, people who have given in the mail already. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity really to work with your current donor population to try to convert them uh, to become mo monthly donors for your organization. Um, here's a quick example uh, of how to promote monthly giving on a donation page. <clears throat> this is the uh, No Kid Hungry donation page. They have, I'm not sure if you can see this, but it says, a monthly gift does even more to help hungry kids. And so um, I think they're doing a good job um, to build as much visibility as possible uh, for their monthly giving program. Hmm. No pointer is not moving forward. There we go. Um, here's another quick example from the Semper Myron Funds, which works to protect redwoods. This is their Redwood Ranger campaign. Um, and I thought this was very clever. Um, they had a goal to get 50 by a certain date. They had a match. They also were giving away an exclusive carabiner. Uh, I thought those were a lot of enticements as part of their campaign, but really um, shows their dedication um, to building um, their monthly, monthly donors on their file. So really um, something for you to think about um, in, in the year ahead. So a couple of quick, quick trends in monthly giving. One is that people are doing these month-long monthly giving campaigns. So here's an example from the SETI Institute. This spring we're looking for 50 stars to join our campaign. Our organization is a donor. They call them SETI stars. Um, so that's definitely um, a, a big trend that we're seeing. I think I have one more example on the next slide. <clears throat> Here's another example from Corporate Accountability International. Um, and uh, you can see that they use a little thermometer here um, to show how far they are towards their goal. Um, a couple of other trends in monthly giving are very low gift levels. Um, so even though $23 is an average um, gift level, um, it's perfectly fine to start as low as you know, $5 and maybe even a little bit less. I would try testing a couple different things. Um, but you know, the idea is to get people in the door and, and, and see how far you can upgrade them. Um, also, monthly giving uh, is great when it's, it can be targeted at lapsed donors. So people who are donors in the past can often be you know, brought back on your file um, with a low monthly gift. So that would be something to think about. Um, and another key trend here uh, is just better credit card management. One of the biggest challenges in monthly giving is that people's credit cards expire. Uh, and so because uh, vendors have improved you know, some of their tools, um, this has been a, a, big, a big management issue and something that's a big trend here uh, in 2018. 
Okay. Um, we have a few more slides to go, which I'll go through uh, as quickly as I can so we can get to the end. One other big uh, trend um, is the development of personal fundraising campaigns. These are sometimes called peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. And I think these have been really popular in the last couple of years. The example over here is from the Best Buddies Challenge. But it's a way for individuals to set a personal goal to raise money for a charity that they're fond of. I mean, you can pick a low number, $250 or a big one like $5,000. Um, you may be you know, you may be doing an event uh, like a bicycle ride or a swim or something like that, or you just may be um, helping out at a certain time of the year um, during the campaign. I think this is a good strategy also for organizations that have smaller email lists because you get to take advantage of um, social platforms and people's network of friends. And really the key here uh, is that you have to sort of work with grassroots volunteers to help you, you know, do the outreach, but many of your organizations have those networks of volunteers, and there are you know, numerous platform options that are out there. And I will actually recommend um, this report by Cathexis Partners, which does a really good job reviewing about, I would say, 30 different platforms that specialize just in personal fundraising campaigns, so that would be something um, for, you to, for you to check out. Whoops, jumped a little bit too fast. Um, a couple of quick trends here um, just to keep in mind. I mean, one is that these succeed when you have a volunteer team of cheerleaders to help you. So uh, just keep that in mind with personal fundraising campaigns. Um, and also they tend to work better when they're tied into an, a fundraising event that you might have. Let's so say you might have a gala scheduled in December, and then you can build up to it with personal fundraising campaigns. Um, we see a lot of folks using Facebook Live events to promote them, which makes a lot of good sense. Uh, and then another couple quick trends is the importance. You know, people sometimes give, you know, I'm going to give five, ten, fifteen, fifty dollars. And the key is really how can you welcome some of these new donors onto your file and then get them to make a second or a third gift. So these are sort of interesting challenges in, in fundraising. But I think the, the biggest benefit of personal fundraising campaigns is that you get to reach out to brand new donors. And as, you, as many of you know, that's really a critical element uh, in, in building a strong fundraising campaign. Um, let's see, social media fundraising. I'll just say a little tiny bit about this. Obviously, um, it fits in very closely with all your other channels, and it's really important that social media fundraising you know, fit in with your email efforts, with the work that you're doing on the web, the work that you're doing at events or in the, re the real world. Um, it has certainly been, certainly been slow to grow as a direct fundraising channel, um, but we know from looking at analytics and looking at studies that the more you have visibility on social media with your supporters and your donors, the more you help uh, increase fundraising in other channels. Uh, and so that's where you know, an an analytics can, can, can fit in. And of course, you know, the critical thing, because a lot of these platforms have become pay-to-play, uh, it's just critical that you be able to boost your posts on platforms and that you put aside advertising dollars to potentially widen your reach. Uh, so something to, to think about as you're, as you're going. So a couple quick trends. Um, one is that uh, the Facebook fundraisers tool continues to be extremely popular. Probably the most common way that we see that are these Facebook birthday campaigns. I have an example of one that my friend did on the right. Um, she was raising money for her birthday. They're very easy to use. You can, uh, and it's long, you, know, you can reach out to your Facebook friends and raise money from them. Um, really the critical thing and really the big trend is that you know, if you are an organization using a Facebook fundraiser, you, know, you, you do have to spend money to boost these, these campaigns and, and get them uh, more, more visible. Um, another big trend is, of course, using Facebook Live uh, throughout social media fundraising campaigns. Also, Facebook Live um, um, makes, your, uh, makes you more visible throughout the Facebook platform and their news algorithm. So Facebook lo loves you when you create live events. So this is really um, a positive um, for you when you want to promote a fundraising campaign on, on social media. And then, of course, um, on places like Facebook, but not only Facebook, 
um, you can use the advertising tools on those platforms to also widen your reach. So if you, uh, for example, upload the email addresses of all your donors onto Facebook, Facebook can literally tell you, you know, how to – it will offer you the opportunity to, to send advertising to your donors for the ones that are on Facebook and will also allow you to create what are called look-alike audiences. Um, so I know that not everybody has used advertising before, but these are incredibly uh, useful opportunities um, for fundraising. Let me show you my last slide on this one point. Oops, a little one, one too many there. Um, which is that uh, I would say about 60% of nonprofits that have been studied you know, have, are, have spent money on digital ads, and it continues to grow every year at about 10 or 15 percent. So I think nonprofits are uh, realizing that digital advertising, you know, gives them an important method for reaching out. So on the one hand, they're able to reach their existing donors with ads in front of them, um, but they're also able to reach out to, you know, people that are like their donors. And because Google and Facebook, you know, make these types of tools available, um, then, you know, it's really a question of nonprofits deciding to put, um, to put some money uh, on the table and to experiment a little bit with some of these digital advertising tools. Two other big trends that are happening um, are the ability to uh, take all the visitors that are coming to your website and to retarget them with advertising. And you can also, as I mentioned earlier, you can retarget people that are uh, abandoning your donation pages. Um, so all of these uh, advertising opportunities um, I think are, are, are useful for fundraising, um, uh, and hopefully more of you will um, experiment with it. And then finally, you know, I know that many nonprofits have taken advantage of Google Ad Grants. Um, that program is still available. Um, it's become a little bit more difficult to use with some of their – how their model has changed, but um, it's still available out there. I mean, you can use it to, to promote fundraising campaigns. We've seen quite a lot of nonprofits decide to move over into the paid Google ads because you get a little bit better performance and you can uh, reach more people that way. But it's exciting, I think, that, that more nonprofits are using digital advertising um, to be able to supplement um, th their fundraising campaign. Okay. I Kind of at the end, Seema, I'll just close just by saying um, a few final thoughts. I think if I had to pick kind of my top six things uh, and to give you some inspiration for digital fundraising, I would say you know, integrating fundraising, digital fundraising channels is really important. It's great to send email, but you have to connect with the content on the web and the content on your social channel. So really the integration is going to make an impact on your donors. Number two, just the importance of creating campaigns that have visibility and a messaging arc and a theme um, that really in the digital space uh, is, is, is really uh, an, an impactful technique. Um, improving the mobile experience is absolutely critical. You know, so many people in digital are on smaller mobile devices, so it's just so important to be able to do that. Improving donation pages, uh, you know, if you can get your average completion rate to get above 17%, then you know, that's uh, less money that you're leaving on the table, so to speak. So I think working in your donation pages is really critical. Promoting monthly giving, I mean, this is obviously the trend of the future. People want to give at lower price points, but give longer and more often. And so you know, making that available to people is really important. And of course, you know, increasing activity on social media, again, it's part of the integration fit um, between all of those, um, all of those pieces. Um, I'll just mention that I put all of the references that I made uh, in this webinar on this one slide um, so that you can go grab a copy. Don't forget that the Benchmark Study new edition comes out in April. And with that, I will pass the baton back to Seema. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was super helpful. Um, we have time for just a couple questions uh, before we, we finish, finish up today's webinar. Um, so one question that I've seen uh, come in a couple of times was, how frequently should one send out campaign-specific emails? It's difficult to find a sweet spot of reminding people to give, but also not bombarding them and risking their unsubscription. So do you have any advice in terms of like email frequency um, and how often people yeah, should be Yeah, boy. That, 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 is, that is certainly a tough question. Um, 
I mean, I think if you, I mean, I, I, as a rule of thumb, I tend to say, you know, once a week. If you're doing a campaign, that's going to last a month. So you could maybe do three or four in a month. I think that's probably uh, a cadence that's probably comfortable for most people. That said, um, I think at the year end, uh, everyone breaks that rule <laughs> left and right, and that's why you end up getting five emails in the last five days of December. Um, so, you know, but I think that's clearly too much uh, to send that many. Um, I mean, I think um, this is why it's important also to compare your campaigns year over year. So if you're doing a spring campaign, like what worked last year? Take a look at which email appeal performed best. Which one, you know, were the open rates declining, declining, declining? Uh, maybe that helps give you some thoughts on, you know, whether the cadence was right or whether you were over messaging. Also look at your unsubscribe rates. If you're seeing a much higher set of unsubscribe rates in a campaign, that could be a sign that you're over messaging people. Got it. Perfect. Um, okay, so I think we have time for um, a couple more questions. So in terms of like the most effective combination of strategies for fundraising, you know, in terms of everything that you presented today, what do you think is kind of the most effective combination of, of these things? Um, or you know, maybe if people are to walk away from this webinar, what's you know, the top two or three things that they should get started on right away to see the highest return? Um, I think growing your email list is probably pretty o always high on the list, and people should be doing it all the time. Um, and because we know how well email performs in digital fundraising, I think that's always something that I would recommend that everyone needs to be doing always. Um, I would certainly think uh, uh, improving donation pages um, to the, or choosing the right vendor that gives you the kind of donation pages you want. I think is, is critical. Um, there's no reason why you should have old donation pages that aren't mobile responsive. And really, donation pages you know, do make a really big difference to donors. That's why so few people convert on those donation pages. So I think you can do a lot better. Um, I think number three, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think promoting monthly giving and being more flex is a way of being more flexible at different you know, price points for donors. I mean, I think donors want to, want, to, want to do partner with you in different ways. And so I think that's why the monthly giving movement is so strong right now. People are like, I want to give less, but I want to give more often and for longer. So it's really important to do that. Um, and I think, you know, you know ultimately just uh, – you know, creating campaigns and, and kind of ma mapping out, you know, how to create a compelling fundraising appeal um, that, that, that is going to be interesting to people, um, you know, make sure that it ties in well to the news cycle or to an event that you're doing or to the themes that your organization is focused on. Um, you know, give it a theme, give it a goal, give it a match or whatever, give it a deadline. I use some of those techniques and get people excited. You know, find a spokesperson who can help um, promote the campaign, uh, and then you know, use the the range of different digital channels at your disposal uh, to promote it. Uh, so if you're doing a campaign, it should be visible on your website, in your email outreach, on your social channels, and in the other channels that you might have at your disposal. Perfect. All right. I think that's a Great closing. Uh, we are at time. So um, just want to thank you again, Michael, for all the information that you shared today. Um, I know a few of you were online and had questions um, that he couldn't get to. So if you want to email him, uh, his email contact information is here. Um, he's also on Twitter. And he also writes regularly for the TechSoup blog. Um, so if you guys want to take a second to, to write this information down. Um, we'll also be emailing these slides uh, after the webinar is over. Um, so just before we go today, it's really helpful for us to always understand um, you know, what you guys walked away with. So if you don't mind chatting one thing in the chat box of one thing that you learned in today's webinar. Um, also, we'll be sending out a post-event survey. So any feedback that you have for us is always really helpful. Um, we incorporate that into our you know, content planning. So if there's stuff that you're interested or want to learn about or um, any gaps that you, you know, missed today, we'd be happy to um, incorporate your feedback into our um, webinar planning for the future. Also, if you are on uh, social media, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so we post a lot of helpful 
tips and tricks. Um, I know a lot of you guys had questions about you know, the different platforms and technologies uh, that Michael was referring to. Um, TechSoup uh, partners with several of these companies to offer it either you know, for free or at cost. Um, so check out our products page, which I believe Lashika sent out earlier. Um, and we have a few upcoming webinars. So um, we have one on 417 about saving time and money, why cloud integrations matter, and then one on 5.1 about online surveying for nonprofits. So I think um, that's another trend that we're seeing. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, that's happening on 5.1. And lastly, thank you again to Michael for your presentation and to our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk and to Lashika for answering questions on the back end. Thank you all.